the acquisition of Energy Africa back in uh, 2000 and, uh, 2004 five is we've actually had this, a big portfolio we've been able to work on, and there's just been a continuous stream of opportunities to maintain production. Uh, the, these assets have been producing around kind of 30,000 barrels a day plus for quite some time, uh, and, and it, it's just there's this stream of activity of infill wells, uh, and, and so a great portfolio effect of, of uh, various fields contributing. Um, We've got activity ongoing, extensive activity. I think that right now there's about five fields in Gabon which we're working infill and work over opportunities. Uh, we just completed a very successful infro, infill program on the SIBA field, uh, which was guided by some new 4D seismic, uh, which worked very well. We're now going to use that 4D seismic to guide the upcoming uh, infill program on Akumi. Um, Again, one of the downsides in the second half was we had planned to already have the Côte d'Ivoire, the Soir and Phil program underway. Unfortunately, as the, the, the rig, ascend, uh, tender assisted rig was rigging up, we were pretty unhappy with the EHS performance of that contractor. Uh, we halted them for a while, gave them a chance to kind of try again. That didn't work and actually the operator has decided to terminate that contract from an EHS perspective. So. That, all that does is it defers some of the uh, infill positive contribution from a SPAR into 2014 rather than seeing some of that impact in the second half of 2013, which is another contributor to the, the updated guidance. Uh, I think the right decision. Um, you know, it, it's easy just to plow on with a, a poor performing and low EHS standard rig and, and kind of make the best of it, but actually it's generally the wrong decision. It's better to cut it there and actually go back to the market and get a higher performing rig contractor in to do that work. Uh, Mauritania and Congo, kind of non-core assets, but continue to produce around 4,000 barrels a day stably. Uh, and the Banda project, the gas to power project in Mauritania, <coughs> yeah, making reasonable progress there on, importantly, the commercial aspects. So that's something we're looking at, and it may, we may get it towards sanction late this year or into 2014. Looking at Jubilee, um, as I said, it's been very stable recently, around about 110,000 barrels a day. Um, well capacity is still in excess of 130,000 barrels a day, so above, as you'd expect, the FPSO capacity. Uh, and what we're doing now is we've got the Phase 1A wells. Many of them have been drilled. We've completed a few of them, uh, both in producers and injectors. We've got a number more to complete, and we'll just complete those uh, as we require them to continue to top up the uh, well capacity. Uh, so no great rush there. Uh, the, the gas uh, compressor upgrades that we've uh, pointed to, they're, they're actually started and on, ongoing at the moment. We hope to have those complete uh, by September. So that should remove the, uh, the gas constraint on the vessel. Uh, and as we mentioned before, um, we've already tested the vessel at about 125,000 barrels a day, on excess of 125. So we hope that uh, when we remove the gas constraint, we should be able to step up, and we're very much on target for that year-end exit of uh, 120,000 barrels a day. And as I mentioned, just in the short term, we, we're going to have to kind of just constrain the rates a little bit. Um, the water injection failure, I say, is a mechanical issue with some of the pumped equipment. Um, we had built up quite a good bank of pressure support, so we, even when the production has been down over the last couple of years, we've been injecting pretty hard, so there's good pressure there in the reservoir. Um, but that, that will deplete, and then we'll, we'll get the injectors back up, back on again and, and, and build it up. So really, the annual average, um, although we've been pushing hard in the first half, likely overall the, year, the annual average for the year uh, to be about 95,000 barrels a day. So beyond this, we're, we're again, I've mentioned before, kind of looking at some blue sky thinking around how could you step up the FPSO capacity. Not quite sure how you could do that, but there are, are some ideas we've got. Uh, and really, that's all about saying we've got a lot of infill potential from the full field development that we can move on and do. We'll only do that as, as we require it to fill the FPSO capacity. There's no point in investing capital early uh, if the FPSO is a constraint, uh, say, 120, 125. So what we're looking to do is could we step up the FPSO capacity and actually accelerate some of that well investment uh, and, and therefore increase the the value of the asset, so that's something we're looking at. And obviously, there's, there's tie-in potential from the West Cape Three Point discoveries, uh, which we wouldn't mind trying to accelerate as well. So that's something that's going on in the background, looking for opportunities to add value to the asset. In 10, uh, 
I say, very pleased to get the POD approved. Um, we've drilled a couple of wells recently in the 10 area in Yenra 6 and the Tom 4, both, both successful, both indicated uh, slightly deeper than expected. Not materially, but slightly deeper than expected all water contacts. So they, they've kind of reinforced um, the resource levels we uh, estimate. Um, we're just finalising the uh, the contractors, uh, sorry, the contracts for the main main items, the FPSO and the various components of the subsea. The West Leo is contracted and working, uh, so that that's the core rig for uh, the drilling campaign, uh, which ultimately will reach about 24 wells, probably around 10 or so before start up. Um, targeting uh, first oil around uh, mid 2016. Um, and uh, the, the overall capital cost now we're guiding around about 4.9. Um, that increase from previous guidance, uh, which we gave kind of as we were going through the contracting process, uh, is made up of a couple of things. Well, one, one is we decided to go for both gas injection and water injection as the reservoir development plan in the TOM. Although it doesn't impact the base case resources or reserves rather uh, materially, what it does is it gives you much greater access to upside scenarios by having both, so we decided to invest a bit more and have water injection in the TOM as well as the gas. Um, we have uh, contributed to the gas export pipeline that runs between the 10 platform or the 10 FPSO and the Jubilee FPSO in our negotiation with government just in terms of finalising the POD. So that was it. And, of, and, and also we've, we've been closing out the various contracts uh, and finalising the scope, and that's caused a bit of creep upwards as well. So that's where we're at, about 4. Uh, Nine million, and uh, as Ian said, we're we're now we've spoken to government about the farm down. Um, they're they're comfortable with that, and that process is uh, now underway. Moving to East Africa, um, talk about Kenya, and then talk about it more regionally. Uh, Angus will obviously come on and talk about the enormous exploration potential across our Kenyan and Ethiopian acreage. What I'm going to do is just focus on. Uh, the Lokachar Basin, where we've uh, made the Nagami and Twiga discoveries. Previously, we'd indicated probably in excess of 250 million barrels uh, from those two wells post the kind of uh, extensive DSTs we did. We made a decision early to focus the rig on uh, testing rather than going off to drill more uh, wells, and actually that turned out to be a very good decision because the result of the testing showed that a number of zones that we were uncertain about whether they were net pay or not net pay turned out to be net pay and contributing oil production. So that was how we managed to up, double effectively in both wells the, the net pay, uh, and that led to the 250 million barrel plus estimate for those two wells. Also, it showed good material uh, production potential from both wells of about 5,000 barrels a day. It's all pretty healthy. Then we had the Atuko discovery, uh, which is still kind of under assessment, the deeper zones under assessment at the moment, but that's looking pretty good. And we think once we get our head around and, and kind of analyse the extent of that, we're going, to, we're going to have the resources well in excess of 300. So whilst we're not in a position today to, to declare commerciality, that's a process that one goes through, does the appraisal, works your development studies, and then goes to the government formally and declares commerciality. That's some way off. I think what we're saying today is, given the volumes we have, we're definitely over the threshold for development. So now we'll start embarking upon looking at what are the development options. Um, the obvious one is uh, the pipeline. We've talked about that before in a Ugandan context, and I'll, I'll talk in the next page about where, where that's at. Um, but the other thing we thought, just to flag, is we see in Kenya possibilities for a kind of start-up production phase. Um, because there is rail infrastructure there. There's a much bigger market within Kenya. There's easier access to the port for any export that we decided to do. Um, so we, we see the potential that, you know, why, why couldn't we be producing kind of 10,000 barrels a day? That, that could come as soon as maybe 2016, that sort of timing. So a lot of question marks over how we do that. The road infrastructure up in northern Kenya is not great, so there'd be a lot of work to be done there. But uh, we definitely think that's a possibility. So that's something we're now just initiating studies on. Uh, and we're going to initiate discussions with governments uh, in the very near future over uh, their, their desire for that and then working together with them to try and deliver it. Um, looking at it more regionally, and uh, first Uganda and then the kind of regional pipeline, 
Um, Uganda, we, we continue to finish off kind of background appraisal work. Uh, Total up in the northern area, pretty busy in Block 1, finishing off their appraisal. We've pretty much finished ours in Block 2, as has uh, Sinuk in, uh, in Block 3. Uh, all of the work to date kind of very much underpins uh, resource estimates of uh, about 1.7 billion. Um, and obviously, in the background, we have a lot of work going on. You know, there's a lot of baseline study work that you do, environmental, social performance study work that you have to do before you get into uh, sanction of the development. There's infrastructure studies going on. We're, we're, we're kind of well into pre-feed and heading towards feed on some of the facility studies, etc. So that work all carries on in the background. Uh, as you know, one of the big challenges in Uganda has been getting an absolute agreement in principle that there will be not just a refinery, there will be a refinery plus a pipe. Uh, that's what the MOU is all about. Uh, things take time in Uganda, and we're still fine uh, doing, doing some of the fine details around the MOU, but the principles, as I said before, were all pretty much agreed. Uh, now, uh, in the recent meeting between President Kenyatta and President Museveni, effectively President Museveni announced the MOU, because what he told the world was there's going to be a pipeline, uh, there's going to be a small local refinery, and actually, there's going to be an extension of the products line to contribute to the balance of security supply for products within Uganda and beyond over. Actually, President Kawami was there too. Um, so he announced the MOU as we were still busy with these uh, bureaucrats trying to finalize some of the details. I think the other important point was he, they, they agreed that Kenya would take the lead on the export pipeline. You know, Kenya has this idea of the Lapset project, which is a, a kind of northern corridor oil export pipeline. Uh, and what we're now very focused on with both the Kenyan government and, and the Uyana government is a kind of not a Lokachara, northern Kenya to Lamu export pipeline for the export of the discoveries we're making in Kenya, and then an extension of that line down to Lake Albert to connect and, and deliver oil from Lake Albert. Um, we, because of the work we had done in Uganda, we pretty much finished all the concept work on that line. Uh, and, and we already have identified the contractor and will be moving fairly quickly into kind of pre-feed work on the line, uh, but engaging a lot more now with the Kenyan government uh, as well as the uh, Ugandan government. So in terms of sum up, um, strong production in the first half of the year. We got some maintenance stuff which will pull down the average a little bit for the, for the full year, but uh, across the portfolio, production has been strong. Uh, 10, we're now in the execute mode and, and very much focused on a mid-year 2016 delivery of 10 successfully and within, within budget. Uh, East Africa is getting incredibly exciting already, even from a, a development point mm -hmm. of view and progressing towards some commercialization of that. Um, and also, uh, we keep focused on the uh, portfolio management aspect of our, our strategy, both in 10 but in, in Southern North Sea in Asia. So with that, I'll uh, hand over to Angus. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so let me run through uh, an update on expiration and appraisal. Um, our strategy remains unchanged, uh, focused very much on oil, a high value light oil uh, focused in Africa and uh, the Atlantic margins. Um, we're going about the discovery of oil in a, uh, a balanced uh, way with a set of uh, six uh, campaigns running in parallel. Um, those campaigns are highlighted there uh, in those uh, ellipses. Um, moving forward, and, but also backwards, looking at our track record, um, an interesting pair of charts here. On the left-hand side, you see our uh, historical uh, volume de delivery uh, track record. Uh, on the vertical axis of that left-hand chart, you see the Tullow net uh, volumes uh, added uh, in million barrels of, uh, of oil equivalent. Um, and along the bottom axis, uh, the years from 2007 uh, through to 2012. Um, the two lines on, on that chart on the left-hand side, the, the brown one uh, represents our East African uh, uh, contingent resource uh, additions uh, net to Tullow uh, through those six years. 
uh, totaling some uh, 700 million barrels all equivalent. And the blue line shows our performance, our track record over those years in delivering in the Atlantic margins nearly some 500 million barrels all equivalent. That's a total of 1,200 million barrels all equivalent over six years. It's an average of 200 million barrels all equivalent annual resource additions. Um, 200 million barrels oil average annual resource additions is what we've delivered in the last six years. We'll deliver it again this year, next year, and the year after. Um, on the right-hand side, you see a chart, um, which on the vertical axis, you see the, um, the returns on our investments, the, uh, and the bottom uh, axis, the, uh, the, the volumes that have been delivered. Uh, this plot has been put together uh, by, um, independently by uh, Wood Mackenzie in their survey and um, benchmarking survey of the exploration industry. And you see our performance against our peers. Um, we are highly competitive uh, in delivering returns uh, well above uh, the cost of our, of our capital. And we're in the right place here, in the top right-hand corner, uh, delivering uh, volume and value. I just added this little um, flying bullet here, uh, Kenya. This is not as much more a part of our recent track record, but 2013 Kenya. You see that we're already on a steeper gradient if you compare that against the, uh, the brown curve of the East African delivery track record. Um, we're, we're up to 150 million barrels net to tallow. That's a 300 million barrel uh, gross uh, number. Uh, but you see that we've reached that point in one and a half years. Uh, where it took over two years to reach that point in uh, the uh, Uganda campaign. So we're off to a, a running start in, uh, in Kenya. Um, to go about opening up these, uh, these basin trends and to deliver that 200 million barrels uh, annual average per year, we have to go about it in a balanced way, um, spread across, spreading our risk across the exploration campaigns. And these campaigns compete for capital and resources, and they evolve uh, and uh, to grow value through time. So from left to right through time, um, as these uh, campaigns uh, take their course, um, we adapt to the outcomes, to the well results uh, that come in, and we build on and reproduce uh, the successes that we have. Um, this is a representative diagram from 2005 through to 2015 going forward. And you see here we split it into two, uh, two colors. The top half uh, represents our East African uh, campaigns through time. And the bottom half of the chart shows our uh, campaigns in the Atlantic margins. In the top part, you see we split it into East African rift basins, the onshore activity and the East African margin, uh, essentially on the margin and moving offshore. Looking at the top one, the success started in, in Uganda in 2006, and that campaign has evolved very successfully into what we're now pursuing in Kenya and Ethiopia. In the East African margin, we've evolved from a position in Tanzania to chasing oil offshore in Mozambique and uh, soon to be exploring and drilling in Madagascar. Um, it's been a successful campaign and approach so far. As you saw from our, our track record, Uganda's a prolific basin. We've had 2.9 billion dilution proceeds already from Uganda. The Kenya-Ethiopia trend, as you'll see at the moment, gives us multiple rift, rift basins with, with, uh, with uh, similar potential. Um, South Lokachar already 300 million barrels, as you've, as, you've, as you've heard. And today we're announcing that we've achieved the threshold uh, for uh, development and only in, in 16 months. Um, looking at the blue... Uh, campaigns, the uh, Atlantic margins, uh, Equatorial Atlantic, uh, Central Atlantic, started off in Equatorial Guinea, led to Ghana, the discovery of Jubilee, and those campaigns have spawned the Cretaceous turbidite plays that we're pursuing uh, in the Atlantic and Mauritania and Guinea and the Guianas and Suriname particularly. Um, what we're looking for there from those three campaigns, Mauritania, Guinea, uh, and the Guianas, is to deliver another jubilee. We see how important the jubilee cash cow is to 
uh, to Tullo, and through these three campaigns, we'd expect to be able to deliver uh, another uh, jubilee. Um, we've also evolved our position in the North Atlantic from one dominated by gas in the Southern North Sea in the UK and the Netherlands, and uh, freshened that up, rejuvenated it with uh, uh, oil prospectivity in, uh, in the more prospective areas of uh, Greenland and uh, Norway. So just uh, running through our uh, uh, balanced spread of exploration and appraisal campaigns, uh, as I said, we have to go about this uh, wildcatting in a, uh, a balanced way, uh, spreading our risks. Uh, and from this activity, we will spawn, and we are spawning, uh, new lower risk uh, activity streams ahead of us. So let's run through these uh, quickly um, from, from left to right on this map. South America, uh, the Atlantic Margins uh, campaign of South America, uh, four out of, uh, sorry, one out of four uh, successes in uh, French Guiana. Uh, not what we would have uh, desired, uh, obviously, uh, but we did get off to a cracking start with uh, Zaidius 1, and we believe there is still strong prospectivity uh, remaining in French Guiana. We believe it's more a matter of uh, well location uh, than uh, anything more fundamental to do with the, the prospectivity and the richness of the plays in French Guiana. But mid-term, our focus uh, turns now to uh, Suriname, to our operated uh, venture uh, offshore Suriname, Block 47, uh, where we are in command of the exploration uh, strategy and where we see some very strong prospectivity ahead of us in our joint venture there with uh, Stato. Um, West Africa, um, the Central Atlantic margins, uh, exciting campaign coming up there. Uh, Frigat 1 to Spud in August on a Cretaceous Turbidite. Uh, Scorpion Prospect, which partially de-risked um, by the uh, deepening of the, the Cormoran uh, one well uh, uh, a while ago. Uh, and some follow-up Wildcats, uh, Tapandar, Sidewinder, and Ibis. Swiftly on, uh, West African Atlantic margins, our focus there shifts to Pound 2, and to explore its appraisal in Côte d'Ivoire and to Guinea and the, the drilling of one of these two prospects, Sili or EOS. Um, we haven't had such success in Sierra Leone and Liberia, so those positions are, are under review as we focus on, on uh, Guinea and Côte d'Ivoire. <coughs> in East Africa, and you'll hear much more of, of this uh, in the rest of my presentation, this is clearly... Uh, the winning campaign of the uh, uh, six uh, campaigns underway. Uh, we weren't to know that a few years ago when we set out on these six, six campaigns, and that's why we spread uh, across these six campaigns. But this is clearly uh, a front runner. Three out of three successes in the South Lockerchar Basin, and we've already uh, exceeded the threshold uh, for development. And we're preparing for more basin opening wildcats uh, in the Omo, Chubahir, Kerio, and the North Lokachar Basins. More on that in a few moments. Uh, East Africa transform margin, important activity there, trying to make a breakthrough uh, on the edge of the gas space and trying to find that elusive oil offshore uh, East Africa. Um, we made a gas discovery at uh, Kakalotti, 38 metres of net pay there. That's not what we're after. Um, we're in pursuit of oil, and we hope we may find it in uh, Busio 1, which is currently drilling. North Atlantic margin positions, um, a strong portfolio in uh, Norway after our acquisition of uh, spring energy. Key wells coming up there, Mantra, uh, adjacent to the troll field, Wisting is about to spud, and uh, a high-risk uh, but big upside play tester at, uh, at Kuro. And our uh, extensive 3D seismic survey in Greenland has thrown up a really uh, giant prospect there, a billion barrel prospect in our uh, acreage in Greenland. And we're currently reviewing our options uh, about uh, how to realize the value from, uh, from that prospect. So turning now to our East Africa uh, tertiary roof basin campaign, as I said, clearly this is the front runner uh, amongst those six uh, exploration campaigns. Um, we showed this uh, type of chart last time we talked uh, half a year ago. Um, the top left-hand uh, 
diagram is a, uh, a cascade of tree of, of outcomes uh, arising from the basin opening well Meputa 1 in Uganda in the Lake Albert Rift Basin. That uh, discovery well led to uh, three plays uh, which were successfully opened by Kasamina 1, Waraga 1 and Kingfisher 1 and those were then followed up at a very high success ratio um, to deliver uh, 1.7 billion barrels of oil discovered. So that becomes the unit of exploration in East Africa. Um, we can forget about well by well. Uh, the unit of exploration in East Africa is the basin. And the basin uh, we've established in uh, Uganda typically has a discoverable volume of about 1.7 billion barrels. Now we have 12 of these basins in our portfolio. Um, one in Uganda discovered, uh, three in Ethiopia, one of which uh, we've drilled the Sabisa well and, and uh, encountered oil shows in the Omo Basin. And we have eight uh, similar rift basins in, in Kenya. Uh, the first one that we drilled, uh, South Lokachar uh, Basin, uh, has delivered immediate success. Within 16 months, achieved the development threshold of 300 mil over well in excess of 300 million barrels. So the way we look at it is, is not really well by well. Um, we look at it in terms of uh, how many of these basins uh, could be successful. And the bottom left-hand chart uh, just lays out some possible campaign scenarios in uh, gross potential billion barrels as the, the vertical axis here um, delivered through time along the, uh, the bottom axis, the horizontal axis. So one, one out of 12 basins, uh, as where we are in Uganda, deliver 1.7 billion barrels. Two basins could deliver 3.5 billion barrels. Four basins is entirely pl plausible and is a sensible risking, uh, could deliver as close to 7 billion, billion barrels. I've also included here an 8 out of 12 uh, basin uh, success scenario. It's a, it's a long shot, but it's something we're going to try and do with frontier exploration. We're going to address each of these basins and see if, um, if that's entirely possible. Um, and that would deliver in excess of 10 billion barrels of uh, oil. So clearly a potential to be a new petroleum uh, province, as, as Aidan rightly described it. Now to do this, um, I put up a technology slide just to just to show how we've moved on from FTG, full tensor gradiometry gravity surveying, uh, which we uh, deployed very successfully in Kenya to deliver that very high success ratio in uh, in, in in Uganda, um, and uh, we're certainly doing FTG, um, but we're doing FTG plus, if you like. We're doing more than FTG. Uh, we're doing what we call ambient enhanced inversion. Now that looks at uh, the full spectrum of geophysics from high resolution uh, local measurements at the laboratory, well logging, borehole seismic scale, all the way through to low resolution regional scale measurements done through gravity instruments, electromagnetic instruments, using natural sources of energy, using the sun, using earthquakes, uh, using this in tidal uh, energy, in fact, as it heaves the rock as the moon uh, goes overhead. Um, so Tull is integrating this, this free and natural ambient energy to enhance our standard active geophysical methods. And this is really a pioneering uh, application of this integrated approach. And we're applying overlapping geophysical methods uh, to invert this geophysical data into the uh, geological models to help us locate uh, oil. So this is pushing FTG to the to the next, the next level. So back to its application in Kenya and Ethiopia, um, we are tackling this uh, 100,000 square kilometer um, opportunity uh, with that technology in uh, three scales of exploration in multiple basins. Um, if you remember, that 100,000 square kilometers is about the size of, of, of England, about the size of the North Sea, actually, these rift basin systems. Um, the, the small scale, the detailed scale, scale, 25 square kilometre scale, is the appraisal testing, which doubled the pay at Megamia and Tweeda South. And you heard from that uh, on that from Paul. 
um, 10,000 uh, barrel oil per day uh, total combined flow rate potential from these, uh, these two wells. A mid-scale of exploration is the drilling out of the South Lokachar uh, Basin. And as I say, we've already exceeded the uh, threshold for development there. Uh, and um, uh, Ituko has made an important new oil discovery. And the third scale is the, the biggest scale, the 100,000 square kilometre scale, the drilling multiple wildcats uh, to open up these uh, other basins. And as part of that programme, Sabisa has established the Omo Basin um, uh, is oil prone. So just zooming in on uh, one of those basins, uh, the first one, uh, South Lokachar Basin, um, map on the left is fairly self-explanatory. You see the green blobs, Twiga South, Nagamia, and uh, Etuko. Importantly, Etuko is on the east side of the, um, the basin. And the, the cross-section in the bottom right shows uh, how we've uh, moved over to the east flank of the, of the rift basin, opened up that play, uh, and the chart above it, you see the uh, the cascade, the tree of of uh, exploration wells and prospects. Uh, Nagamia opened the basin. Twiga uh, it continued our work along the rift bounding uh, uh, fault play. The string of pearls uh, is currently being followed up at Ikalis, which is a well being drilled uh, as we speak between uh, Twiga uh, South and Nagamia, and we're very hopeful. Uh, for that well, it's ideally placed between two uh, discoveries. And then a two course, as they importantly opened the rift flank play with lots of uh, prospects to follow up over there. So two rigs drilling out this basin, a third rig and a dedicated uh, testing unit contracted to support uh, increased activity uh, in uh, Kenya by the year end. So I just put together uh, in my, these are my final slides here, a series of cross-sections uh, to give you a sense of the scale of this opportunity uh, that we're pursuing. What we've been talking about through the majority of this presentation um, has been our success in the South Lokachar Basin and the drilling results uh, from 2012 and uh, beyond at Nagami and Twiga. And then we've extended uh, that uh, success by moving out onto the eastern flank of the South Lokachar Basin with a success at Etuko. 2014, we're going to move over into the South Kerio Basin, see if we can carry on that success with a number of wells um, over in the South Kerio Basin. And build on that, move into the North Kerio uh, Basin, try and replicate the success and move that, move that success through the mm -hmm. Rift Basin series. Looking to the north, there's also opportunity to the north of South Lokachar Basin, and to the North Lokachar Basin with wells uh, there, Towsie 1, Key Well, next year, 2014. Then jump across the Tur Turkwell Basin in 2015. To th but before doing that, we'll be going up to the Turkana Basin, North Turkana Basin, and drilling there in, in 2014, some key wells, some oil seeps, uh, to pursue in that area too, so an exciting uh, potential. And then the well this year, uh, Sabisa 1 in the South Omo Basin, um, where we had uh, oil shows. And then finally, um, the Chubahir Basin, in fact, there's two basins, the Chubahir North, Chubahir South, um, with some very exciting amplitude-supported uh, prospectivity uh, in that basin. So you get a sense of the scale of the opportunity from this series of, of slides. And as, you know, as Aidan mentioned, you know, the last time the industry was on the brink of, of an opportunity set like this, a set of rift basins was when in the 60s when the, the North Sea rift basin sequence was, uh, was opened up. So Antal was in a very commanding position, high equity uh, commanding position over the whole, the whole basin system, the whole province. So, just in close, um, we don't get to be in these privileged positions to be sitting on top of petroleum, potential petroleum provinces without taking wildcat risks. And we don't get to these special places without having a balanced approach to, to exploration and spreading our exploration risks across a portfolio of uh, activity. But what we can be sure is from that portfolio activity, we will be delivering as we have been, 200 million barrels of oil mean resources uh, per annum.
So with that, I'll just uh, hand over to Aidan for conclusions. Um, well, not much more to say before we open up um, to questions, but I think um, you know we're, we're pretty happy with the shape of the business. We're pretty happy with the prospects, and we're pretty happy with the um, the way the business was going. I, I think um, you know I, I, I mentioned this on, on various road shows when we travel around with with some of you guys. Um, the big the big real challenge is is how do you value our business and. You know, we manage the business uh, on, a, on a very different way from the way that uh, a business is analysed um, by um, the investment um, community, which tends to be on a on a well by well basis and, a, and on a on an asset by asset basis. But that's not how we look at the business. That's not how we manage it. Uh, and, and we manage it much more on a portfolio basis and. So when we're looking at our targets and we're looking at the way that we assess how we're doing as a, as a business, it is, it is very different uh, from the way that um, you know you guys would would look at the valuations. And you know, so I think it's um, you know um, we struggle ourselves to find out you know how Tullow should be valued. Um, we'd be much more focused on literally getting on with the business. Um, you guys are a lot smarter than me. I couldn't do your jobs. I know um, I joked with some of you that I, I think you're all useless, um, which is not the case. <laughs> but it's just the fact that how do you find a way that actually matches more the way that we run the business? Um, and it's a, it is a different type of business. There is, there is no other business out there the same as Tullow. You know, there's a lot of oil companies out there. There's a lot of exploration companies. But there's actually no company out there that actually does it the way that we do it, and the subtle changes in, in, in the way that we manage our business. Um, and I think um, the, the challenge is really to uh, to find a, a a a mechanism for actually looking at how the business is valued, and and then how we are performing against that. Um, and I'm not sure how that can be achieved. But anyway, I'll leave it at that and open it up to the, the floor. Morning, gents. Uh, T-Pan from Numira. Um, focusing on Kenya, actually. Three or four questions, please. Um, very interested in your comment when you when you talk about East Africa and valuing basins. So in terms of the South Locker chart, I just want to, you know, if you could sort of conceptualize where we are in terms of a P50 rather than in terms of your expectations for the basin. Um, I know you've talked about 300 million barrels or in excess of that. Seems like a, a P10 could be 1.7 if you think of Lake Albert. So what should the market really think in terms of how, how clear cut we've de-risked? Um, this basin today. Secondly, just in terms of drilling efficiency, I think it's been a sort of criticism in the market that these wells have been more expensive uh, and taken longer to drill. So I wanted to know uh, whether you see sort of uh, immediate improvements on that in the, in the coming months. Um, and then just lastly, I guess um, there is the opportunity for the government to back in. Um, I wanted to know what you thought in terms of timing and is it really a, a carry from Tullow and its partner? Uh, and therefore, does that put any um, constraints on levels of activity if your partner can't actually fund uh, the drilling program? Thank you. Deepan, uh, I'll handle the, the first part of the question around the, uh, our volumetric estimates in uh, South Lockerchar. The, the numbers we're giving, this well in excess of 300 million barrels from three wells is a, is a P-mean, is a mean, mean value. Um, the, our guidance uh, for a typical East African basin is against our only yardstick we have at the moment, which is the Lake Albert Rift Basin, uh, which is a 1.7 billion barrels discovered. Um, Everything that we've uh, drilled and done in uh, the South Lokachar Basin so far has been better than anything we ever did at the beginning of the Uganda campaign. So, you know, that, that's a positive. Um, 
So we're not working our way up to the, the Lake Albert Rift Basin position with a struggle. We're jumping up to those volumes pretty quickly. I mean, for instance, the uh, which is a good omen, you know, the, the bodes well for the uh, for the for the ultimate size of the basin. Um, for instance, the Nagamia net pay after testing was demonstrated to be 200 meters. Um, you know, the biggest net pay we've ever got in Uganda is about 45 to 50, 50 meters. So, you know, th this is this is a very material uh, basin. Yeah. Um, <coughs> if I take the, the last two um, on the drilling efficiency, I mean, we need to kind of recognise we're in a pretty remote location. Um, logistics are pretty tough up there, especially when you're drilling your first one or two wells. Um, so I suppose the well costs, when you look at them holistically, because when we take the well costs, we can add in the overheads and the logistics and everything associated with the well. So those early wells are taking quite a big burden in terms of cost. So that'd be one thing. And you know, as you bring more rigs in, and that whole logistical cost is spread over a bigger campaign, that by its nature then reduces uh, the individual well costs. So that's something that were is going to happen. Um, I think the other thing is um, our ability to drill the wells. You know that we we elected to use water-based muds. That was not driven by uh, performance, drilling efficiency, performance. It was driven by environmental considerations. We learned some lessons in Uganda that when you go in early, make sure you balance. So you got to manage your cuttings. Um, that you bring out these wells. We're in quite a sensitive environmental area. So until you get to understand the area try and balance off drilling efficiency and environmental performance, and that's what we've been doing in the early wells. Uh, in fact, in this last well, Atuko, we've continued to evolve the, the mud, uh, and the, the drilling and well performance has been much better in Atuko, and uh, our ability to, to uh, keep the hole in shape, etc., which actually speeds up the well. Um, you'd much rather drill these wells with kind of synthetic oil-based mud, which again is something that we're actually progressing in parallel looking because that then brings environmental challenges and disposal challenges and what you've got to do is take your time to work out how you're going to manage those so that's something that's ongoing in parallel and then I guess finally when you go in for these first couple of wells um, you're bringing contractors with you you make no promises about big campaigns so contracting cost tends to be quite high um, and again another lesson learned from Uganda what we've done here is after the initial um, the initial wells We've just gone out and retendered all of our um, services, um, and actually we're looking at the tendering for rigs and replacing rigs. So really moving off a kind of one well, two well type cost base from a service perspective to a three-year uh, contract, and there's some pretty dramatic uh, savings when you look at the service components that we're going to see in those wells as we enact and sign up those new contracts. So, yeah. I mean, we will see a, a very strong learning curve and uh, cost curve in terms of well by well as we work our way through this campaign. That's just the nature of the area we're in. We're not sitting in the North Sea where everything's around us. Um, I think in terms of the government of Kenya backing, I mean, they, they have backing rights and there's various contracts and they vary slightly. Um, but that will generally be, I mean, it's very important to recognise declaration of commerciality to be a different thing to what we're talking about today, which is we're just acknowledging that, you know, in excess of 300 million barrels, we're going to develop this area in some shape or form. As Angus said, there's a lot more to come. So we're not declaring commerciality today, we're just acknowledging that. And generally, government backing will come at that declaration of commerciality. So we don't see it impacting the pace whatsoever. Sorry. Thanks, guys. It's Brendan Morn from Jefferies. Just two questions, if I can may. Just first question on the 10 farm down process. Uh, if you can give us an update or make some comments just on the either ring fencing or uh, separation of the 10 field from the Jubilee. And I notice you show that there's now different parts on mm -hmm. your slide 27. And just as we move towards free cash flows, if you can just comment on the, on the increases of CapEx. Uh, whether you're going to see costing or capex increases at, at your group level, and the second question, I guess, uh, for Angus, just in terms of um, your understanding of the Tuco well results and the basin flank play, uh, can you just talk about the materiality of that play concept to Kenya, 
uh, for other basins, just the risks in and around it and how situational is that depositional environment. I think, uh, Brendan, on the first part, what we plan to do is, and we've talked about this somewhat with the government, is to actually have two unit operating units within the Deepwater Tunnel Licence. So one effectively will be for the Tenfield and one will be for the Balance of Jubilee. So we're, that's a sort of mechanism where we're able to more simply um, kind of split, split the activities. Um, as regards CapEx, you know, we always give you sort of CapEx forecasts, uh, you know, kind of with the full year results. Um, but our CapEx is saying that we, you know, we will, we will be managing Angus's expiration appraisal CapEx around a billion, and we see with the, uh, you know, the farm down activity that our, our DNO CapEx is saying that we will manage to, you know, at or below levels um, currently. So, uh, you know, I, I don't see a lot of um, need for any CapEx increase. And in fact, over time, we'll be looking to decrease them. Yeah, and then on the significance of the uh, Etuco well result, but clearly, as I showed in my graphic on the cross section, it you know, takes the play away from the, the string of pearls on the west side on the basin by fault across to the uh, to the rift uh, uh, rift flank, the uh, shallower section of the uh, of the rift, rift basin. That's the same setting in which we had a lot of success in Uganda. Um, with the plays up in the Butiaba area now in in, uh, in block uh, block one, the total operated uh, area, and in the northern part of of block two in uh, Uganda, the total operated area, um, and that's where the bulk of the volume ultimately came from, as the uh, the basin flank play in in Uganda. Uh, it's early days with with uh, one one well uh, there, so we really can't extrapolate too too wildly from it. Um, I think comparing the three wells so far, you know, Nagamia is clearly the best well of the three so far, uh, but it's still a, a very low well count to be able to make any sensible forecasts. Um, so at the moment, it's maybe 50-50 in terms of volumes on the on the flank and volumes on the on the pearls. Um, and then to take the next step to try and forecast how that might split in in undrilled basins, I think it's just too far first. So we will, we will first of all try and uh, open those basins. And when we when we make the basin opening well picks, what we try to do is uh, maximise the chance of encountering oil. Uh, so we model where the uh, the kitchen uh, is likely to be. We use these uh, integrated uh, 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 technologies, including these ambient uh, sources. Um, to try and minimise the risk of these basin opening uh, wildcats, and then, and then we'll start to split the basin into into flanks and bounding fall plays. Okay. Uh, good morning. It's, it's Michael also from City. Um, I've got uh, one key question, which is on French Guyana. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you've actually booked in terms of contingent resources for Zydeus uh, today? And perhaps on that basis, um, wh why you decided to go for the final well in the campaign as a sort of what looks like a delineation of what you've already discovered. Um, and on that basis, it, it, you know, does that mean that the partnership group feels that there is commercial volumes sufficient to underpin a development as ideas today? Um, and if not, again, why, why, why go for that well and not go for further exploration upside? Yeah. And just to follow on, on just on Kenya, just to sort of comment on the discussions early on in Kenya. Um, you've obviously mentioned early production at Uganda. Um, how different is this at Kenya? Um, and, and why are you confident on potentially doing early production at Kenya? And uh, given it's quite remote, you know, how do you feel comfortable that 2016 is a potential first haul date? Thanks. Um, Michael, rather than uh, pulling a number out of my head for the resources, we'll get back to you in this community quickly as we can on that number, but what I can say is it's a, it's a modest number, it's a very small number um, booked on the French uh, Yanis Ideas one, one well. Um, the uh, logic uh, for drilling the, the next well GMES 5 is one that's been worked up uh, by the, the joint venture, um, which um, is driven by uh, reservoir engineering principles to measure um, a, uh, the pressure of the water in the water leg uh, down dip from Zydeus 1 and with that data to then um, establish the oil level of the oil water contact between the oil found in Zydeus 1 and the, 
uh, what we expect to be um, water leg um, in the position uh, that GMES 5 will be drilled. Um, the well will also penetrate undrilled section, um, so there is uh, you know, opportunity for some serendipity there. Um, but um, you know, our guidance uh, is uh, to, see, to see this as very much a technical well uh, to try and establish all water contact in, in Zydeus 1. Um, once the rig's moved away from uh, GMES 5, then I think that's a great opportunity for the, uh, the venture to, uh, to sit together and look at the, uh, the campaign, the results. Um, you know, obviously, we got off to a cracking start with the uh, tullow operated Sidious 1 discovery, taking a Jubilee play across and finding 72 metres of net oil pay, um, a bang on prognosis, and then thereafter. Um, in the, the, the then newly established joint venture, we were unable to to follow up on that success. I, we believe that much of that has to do with with the, the locations, the precise locations at which the wells were, were placed uh, in that campaign. Um, we look at the three 3D seismic surveys that have been acquired. Um, one uh, in the um, over the big giant Singulata fan system, one to the north west up in the, uh, on the eastern slope and one down near the Brazilian border. And these three seismic surveys are showing and continue to show considerable prospectivity, uh, undrilled prospectivity. So we see very little impact uh, actually from these, uh, uh, the locations of these wells uh, on the remaining uh, prospectivity. So we're keen, keen to, uh, to work out the best exploration program going forward. But we need Need a bit of a break, a bit of a thinking time on that one. But meanwhile, from a Tullow perspective, what we're doing is focusing midterm on our Tullow operated acreage in Suriname. Uh, similar geology, similar plays. We got a cracking 3D survey on our block 47, high equity, 70% Tullow. Statol's a partner there. Um, we're in control of the exploration uh, strategy and the, um, the the prospect picking, uh, so we're we're hopeful for for uh, success and follow up from Zydeus one, uh, but it, in, it may come in a midterm through uh, ex our exploration in in Suriname. Okay. I think on the uh, Kenya uh, item, Kenya Uganda, and the, the comparison. I mean, I, I think uh, they might be neighbours, but the, the political and business environment in those two countries is dramatically different. I think that's that's one big factor. Um, in Uganda, we did work quite hard at trying to get some early production going, uh, and really for various um, political, bureaucratic, and, and other, I suppose, uh, remote region reasons, we never quite going got it going. Uh, we do have a, quite a lot of tanks sitting down in the field full of oil. We've never really been able to mobilise that oil for various reasons. I think, but we're not saying today that we have all the solutions to get early production going in Kenya, but when we stand back and look at Kenya as an environment, I mean, a good example is um, on the pictures, I didn't pick up on it, but the area of interest, um, you know, there was early, I mean, in, in Uganda, we have to work our way through uh, the, the stage gate mm -hmm. process for every individual field. You know, we make a discovery. We then have to appraise. We then have to declare commercial. And, and the, these fields are not commercial in their own right. They're commercial because there's a whole package of fields. Uh, we went in and spoke about that to the Kenyan government uh, and, and proposed that what we should do is um, the, the area, the, the fault-bound area that Angus talked about in the Lockchair, we should declare that as an area of interest uh, and, and work an appraisal, exploration appraisal campaign for that area and kind of then go on and declare the area commercial ultimately. And they saw that as a very practical way forward. And it wasn't exactly contemplated in the PSE, but it didn't contradict it. Um, and they see that as a, well, that, that makes life much more efficient, so let's do it that way. So you're dealing with a, quite a different. So I, I think when we get down to engaging with the government, I think they'll be very enthusiastic work with us to look for ways and opportunities to get early production going. Uh, there's a railway there which is being upgraded and can, is, is importing these sort of volumes uh, from Mombasa to Eldoret. So there's no reason physically that the volumes can't go the other way. Uh, and there is some 
challenges around the road infrastructure up in that part of the world. But again, that's something that can be resolved pretty swiftly if there's a desire to do so. So we think the environment is right, and I say we haven't solved all the challenges, and there are some. Um, but we're going to get after those challenges, and I think we'll be doing that in strong partnership with the government when we get to sit down and talk to them about it. Can I just make one further comment on French Guiana, just slightly more controversial than Angus? Um, you know, the, the, uh, we have different views on how to explore in these areas, um, and you know, I think you know whether or not the wells were right or not, I think our, our, our assessment of French Guiana and the prospectivity of it, I think, um, you know, we will wait until the wells and the prospects are drilled that we would have drilled before we will really have any judgment of whether this is a really good area or not. And I think it's uh, our, our approach as an explorer is to find as much oil as we can. Um, and I think the uh, the um, you know, we, we do not have the voting rights to dictate where wells are drilled. It's something we'll learn from the future. Right, 20 questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's just one strategic question. You're a very diverse company, very large company. You clearly like operating. Do you think now's the time to be more aggressive on restructuring essentially get rid of everything you don't operate? I think, I think uh, um, you know, we've, you continually learn. And I think, you know, we, we have made a lot of mistakes over the years. We have uh, gone into things we, should have, we shouldn't have got into. I think one thing that we have learned is that when it comes to expiration, if you are an expiration-focused business and you do things in a particular way, um, you are better off operating it. And you know, I I don't think in any new basin in the future that we get into that we will give up the operatorship. You know, I think um, you know Kenya is a classic example. We are we are going to operate Kenya. Um, and you know, if we had, if we were still in in French Guiana as operating it. Uh, I think we would drill different wells. We may not have any better results, but we would have a different approach to it. Um, so I think what, what, we're, what we're looking at is, is a business where we can't be all things to all men. We don't want to be. Um, you know, we don't want to be in the midstream or downstream. We want to be an upstream c c company. Um, the, the areas that we are focusing on, you know, I think we're, we're very fortunate that we have um, two fantastic areas uh, in West Africa and in East Africa, and you know the teams that, that we have can easily manage those. Uh, it's when we spread out that you know we have to think twice about it. And I know a lot of our shareholders were um, a bit nervous about Tullow getting too big, uh, mm -hmm. manpower-wise, and that uh, too spread of our operations. But you know, if if you are um, if you have a, a, a very big and focused exploration team, which we have, um, some of the major oil companies do not have. They're more development type teams. Um, and if you can lose money, you know, and so it's it's a balance between them, and I think that's something that we have to look at going going forward. So I think our our tendency right now is is uh, if we get valuable assets, where we find oil, we operate it. I think maybe just to add to that from the operational capability point of view, actually the exploration campaigns, we can operate them without any great expansion to the company. You know, we can we can actually efficiently operate quite a number of exploration campaigns. It's when you come to the development, you have to be much more selective about which of the developments you're going to operate. But again, you know, the West African portfolio that I mentioned is we, we have quite a lot of subsurface influence in that. But we don't operate any of it, and it has been incredibly successful. Uh, and I think we've we've played a part in that success since 2004 or 5. So I, I think operatorship, as Aidan says, very important exploration, and we can manage that very easily without any great expansion to Tullow. And um, we just have to be careful when we get to that development point that we carefully select, because that's when you do get a, a large increase in scale in terms of numbers of people. And so we just need to be selective at that point. 
com coming back to the development of the East African uh, section, now you're talking to the, or you're about to talk to the Kenyan government. You know, it seems that the different partners have different agendas and so on. So, how do you ensure that you know everyone is aligned here? Do you need to realign the, the, the different stakeholders into this? I mean, can you maintain that 50% stake that you have in Kenya before you push forward? Well, uh, uh, first of all, on the on the 50% of Kenya, um, you know, we would keep the 50% of Kenya. Um, you know, we have uh, a fantastic position there. This is this is um, it's not cheap exploration, but it's 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 reasonably cheap compared to um, offshore exploration. So, um, and the um, the how we link in with the other areas, the you know, as Paul was saying, there, there is uh, a pipeline studies currently going on. There's a Lapsat study there before we found oil in, in, in Kenya, where the Kenyan government were working with Ethiopia and southern Sudan on a pipeline system. Uh, the presidents have all agreed on a pipeline. Um, the, the Kenyan side is, is a, you know, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward uh, pipeline. Um, now, we're not going to be building the pipeline. Like this is not a Tullow project. We're not midstream or downstream. So, but there is a, enough interest there from companies who are currently trying to get involved in that. So, so we see a pipeline infrastructure there, um, and a pipeline business. This is a, a third-party business, um, and all, all the governments are, are, are have bought in to it now, and I think that'll be a, a reality pretty quickly. Paul, do no, I, I think you're right, Aidan. I mean, but again, you, you mentioned that some of the partners being misaligned. I mean, the partners are very aligned in Uganda with a partnership which is very aligned on we need to have an export pipeline, and we've now got to that point where there's full agreement on that. Um, our partnership in um, Kenya is very aligned on the exploration importance and, and pursuing that at pace but also considering early development. So we've got good alignment in both places. And I think there's a real advantage that Tullow has, uh, and I think that some of the skills that Tullow brings is having a foot in each camp and then managing the, 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 say the politics and, and, and bringing those two countries together and helping them you know, put in place a good regional plan. And I think that's where we bring, bring our skills. And I, and I think you know, it's good that in Uganda we don't have the whole burden of development. I mean, we, we've got two big companies there who will be doing a very major part of that development. So, again, back to the previous point, you've got to be selective. You know, we get to that scale, you wouldn't want to be doing that major development in Uganda, given the complexity, on your own. Um, so I, I think, you know, the, the, uh, the pace at which we're moving is good, and I think there's strong alignment, actually, across the region. Raheem Kareem from, from Barclays. Um, if I could just change tack and maybe focus a little bit on the North Atlantic uh, part of the business. Just wondering if there was anything that you'd like to comment on around the integration process with Spring, how that's gone, uh, whether it's gone to plan, you know, uh, where, where, where you might be able to see upside f from when you, you first made that move. Uh, and then second, it might be a little bit early, but you made some interesting comments, Angus, around Greenland, mm. um, where, whether you can share any more light or shed any more light on that at this stage. I got the Greenland question. To, can you Sorry, the first question was just around spring, the integration, how that's going. All right, okay. No, that's um, it's going very well. We've I mean, we we adopted um, a philosophy of um, you know uh, first of all based on an observation that spring is working very well. They have a very efficient, uh, a very effective uh, management team, very ex efficient, effective exploration capabilities. So our philosophy has been um, really to let that capability role and run and uh, to integrate uh, in a very transitional uh, a collaborative way. Um, we made a lot of progress on that in integration and uh, there's a lot of um, genuine uh, goodwill about bringing, bringing these capabilities of Tullow and, and Spring Energy to together. So all in all, a very positive uh, process underway, but a, you know, a, a, a gradual and um, <clears throat> Um, um, uh, understanding process, yeah, mutually understanding process. Uh, it's leading to the campaign that we see ahead of us, the uh, particular Wisting, the Mantra, and the Kuru Wells ahead of us. So we'll see how it, how it delivers in terms of exploration performance. But a lot of those uh, 
uh, prospects are obviously set up uh, by by spring. But we, looking forward, we're working with them uh, in on the new rounds, building up acreage positions uh, using the, the capability of Tullo Norge and uh, and uh, the group uh, exploration capability. Uh, so it's very much a collaborative, integrated process uh, going forward. Um, and then, sorry, another question. Greenland, yeah. The Greenland uh, acreage, um, which we share with uh, Maersk and Nuna Oil, uh, 3D survey been, has been acquired, um, and it's um, identified a, a, a very large um, uh, prospect, um, which we currently assess to have about a billion barrel um, uh, potential. Um, this is a, a prospect that we are not... Uh, currently committed to drill. We have a drill or drop decision uh, ahead of us and we're currently reviewing our options for uh, extracting value from that prospect that we've revealed through the 3D seismic. We're not ruling out any, any options going forward. Okay. Hi, uh, Thomas Adolf from Credit Suisse. Uh, one question on Uganda and one on 10, please. Just on Uganda, what's your base case for FID, and is it at that point you look to further farm down your equity stake uh, in, across the three blocks, and what's the ideal equity position in Uganda? Second question is on 10. Um, obviously, the fa uh, first phase will commercialize about 300 million barrels of oil and gas, of which 80% is oil. 80 kbd oil capacity was at this stage not additional upside for uh, a potential uh, partner that comes in to farm into 10. So from an NOC's perspective, buying 20% will give an NOC 16 kbd of equity coverage, uh, which doesn't see, you know, seem very big. So what's really the selling point uh, of the 10 asset? Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take the Uganda one and, and uh, leave Ian to take the 10. The, on, on the FID in Uganda, I mean, very much now we, we were working towards a kind of uh, 15, late 14, 15 kind of FID in Uganda. Um, I mean, that's very much now linked into Kenya and we'll move to two in parallel. So that, that's our thinking. Um, with respect to farm down, I think our focus is on Let's get it. You know, we had one value point where we went down from 100% to 33. Uh, we recognise as we go forward there'll be another value point in, in terms of should we reduce our equity further at that point, and that's kind of around FID. Um, and I don't think we have a view yet what ideal equity levels are for us because I think what we need to do is assess what it all looks like at FID. So I think, as Aidan said very, at the very beginning, you know, we're not in any rush to do anything. We, we get it to FID, we look, look at the, com, you know, Uganda plus Kenya together, what the combined entity looks like, our equities in both places, and then we sit down and we assess what's right for Tull. Um, but there's no real point in trying to second guess that at the moment. But we do see that as the next big value point. But the only thing that we'll say is that if you look at the strategy, we have we have a financing package, and that's what we stick within. You know, and so the level of farm down that we have, or the level of development carry, depending on that. So we don't fear outside that. Okay, so if I understand the question on ten, I mean, I think you know, the, certainly the the farm end will be both to the you know project as currently specified, the the three hundred plus the upside as well, and and obviously you know the wild wild discovery and so on and so forth would all be in, 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 in kind of in that acreage um, and I think that you know as Aidan said you know this is an attractive project certainly as we've talked to folks in the in early marketing um, access to Ghana stable country um, you know people sometimes also see this as the beginning of a relationship with Tolo in terms of the future as well so um, you know and you know, a lot of companies are very interested right now in, in, in acquiring assets which are on their way to production, and certainly, as, as you said, you know, sort of, uh, you know, from an NOC perspective, a lot of uh, desire to achieve uh, reserves in production. So, uh, you know, we, we are seeing that demand. It's uh, Andrew Wiesel from Librem. Uh, Ian, are you really confident that you'll get the money from Heritage 
within the next month? And could you just talk through any um, accounting issues that we should be aware of? And uh, just a point of detail, uh, what, what's the guidance for the tax rate in the second half of this year, and what should we, what should we, we be plugging into the models? Okay, on, uh, I mean, on heritage, I mean, it's, it's relatively straightforward, Andrew, that the judge has ruled that heritage should pay us the $283 million uh, absolutely as quickly as possible, and we're in the process of putting in place the arrangements um, for that, to release that from the, um, you know, from the bank account. And then they should pay uh, the balance, $60 million, in terms of interest and costs by the 26th of August. Uh, that is the ruling. Um, Heritage uh, does have the right to appeal the judgment, but not appeal the payment of the money. So, uh, you know, that, that's how that's been, been ruled, and that's how we expect that to work. Um, I'm not sure what, actually what your question was about the accounting issues, what you meant there. Just cash in, sort of work capital. No, I'm um, sorry, right. So, good news, yeah, cash in. And uh, so, it'll be if you're in the exact accounting debit, cash, credit, debtor. <laughs> <laughs> Could I ask Angus, uh, Thomas Martin, and Canaccord a couple of questions on um, Kenya, I'm afraid, on the exploration side? You had this big net pay uplift after testing mm. on the first two wells. Have you got zones excluded from the net pay estimate on a TUCO pending testing? Or have you applied the learnings in the, the current published net pay estimates? Yeah. Um, and secondly, you know, you spoke about the very thick net pay you've got to date versus Uganda. Appreciate you're only three wells in. But what would you need to see to start thinking about basin potential perhaps even beyond what you had in Uganda? Okay. Um, yeah, if you read the, 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 the text of our announcement on Atuko, you'll see that we talk of a potential net pay and we will be production testing it. And the reason we say that, and that's the additional 50 metres in the, in the lower Lacone. Um, the previous announcement was a 40 metres of, of oil pay in the, um, in the Awewa and uh, uh, upper Lacone sands and the sands in the, in the uh, Lacone shale. Uh, that that is a clearly defined net oil pay with oil recovered to uh, surface. Yeah, so that was clear. Um, the the slight hesitation at the moment around the um, uh, the pay, the 50 metres pay in the lower Lacone, and calling it potential net pay, is because we've learnt um, from the similar formation in um, in Nagamia and in Tuiga South. That, uh, that requires flow testing uh, to um, come up with a more accurate pay, pay tally. Um, but we were successful in, in Nagamia and in, in Tuiga South. We have flowed this unit at uh, 281 uh, barrels of oil per day. The lower Lacone isn't, uh, the, the, isn't the number one uh, uh, reservoir in the basin. The, the Awawa and the upper Lacone sands and the sands in the uh, in the Lacone Shale are the, um, <coughs> are the better reser reservoirs. Is that clear? Um, but the, you know, the interesting observation is that we're finding over kilometres of oil-bearing sands in these wells. Um, so, you know, this is uh, a much bigger, you know, gross oil-bearing interval than we've ever seen before. So, in, you know, in Uganda, you might get 45, 50 metres net pay in your best well, and the biggest gross oil bearing interval might be 200 metres. Here we're seeing uh, gross oil bearing intervals over a kilometre. Um, and that is the, you know, that is the, 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 the play interval that we're, that we're working with. Clearly a prolific source rock is able to charge the string of pearls play and the, uh, the basin flank play uh, to the amount of over a kilometre of of oil bearing section on both sides of the basin, so it is it is it does have a potential bigger than than, than the Lake Albert Rift Basin, but we haven't been able to prove that or establish that yet. So our guidance for the moment is just consider this mm -hmm. our, our our rule, you know, our, our yardstick for a basin in East Africa so far is the only one we know very well, and that's Uganda, and that's 1.7. So let's use that as our yardstick for the moment. But there's room for that to go up. 
in Kenya. Um, hi there, it's James Thompson from JP Morgan. Just very quickly from me, I uh, just wanted to clarify one thing from earlier, actually. In terms of the 300 million barrels from the first three wells, or in excess of that, is the P mean in excess of 300 million barrels, or is it 300 million barrels from those three? And if it's the latter, and I could pin you down on a number, what would be the kind of P something for that for, for 300 million barrels? And just very quickly as well, I noticed on the charts there's a prospect called Ngamia West. Is that a new play type within these basins? It sort of sits out with the kind of string of pearls idea and just wanted to get a bit more detail on that. Thanks very much. Right. Uh, no, three, three, in excess of 300 million barrels is a, is a, is a P mean statement. Yeah. So it's, it is more than 300. We're just not going to be too precise at the, at the moment. Um, it's built up from... The game in two year, which is 250 plus, yeah, plus the two core result gets us to something uh, well above uh, 300 million barrels. I mean, that's all we're going to say at, at, at the moment. Um, the Nagamia West uh, prospect is um, essentially Nagamia up dip and closer to the uh, basin bounding fault. Um, so as we locate these wells, um, you know, with it, in the absence of too much data, as was the case when we drilled uh, um, Nagamia um, and in Twiga South, you have to take a view on how far away from the basin bounding fault you go. Uh, so you go several kilometres into the basin uh, before starting to drill your well. But in doing so, you leave attic oil, if you like, uh, inboard between the well and the uh, and the basin bounding fault. So Nagamia West is one of those sorts of targets in between the well and the basin bounding fault yeah so it's part of the base it's part of the string of pearls family yeah brian gallagher and from investec uh, you mentioned that you've discussed the 10 10 farm down process with the Ghanaian government have you discussed tax at all in that discussion there are no taxes <clears throat> Hi, it's uh, Nish Kapalia from Tudor Pickering Holt. Um, got a question on really looking at the production outlook over the next few years and the, and, and the cash flow impact. Um, you know, it looks like production next year will be around the 70, 75,000 barrel a day mark with production staying flat, it seems, until 2017 when you see, see a ramp up from a number of projects. Um, just wanted to kind of clarify that, understand what the cash flow impact will be between 2014 and 2016, whether that's going to be flat or, or declining due to PSC or um, IRR threshold impacts. Um, and just also on the production side, just wondering what you would expect in terms of potential first oil timing from Zydeus and from Payon, if successful, in, 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 in those two countries. Thanks. Um, may I touch on the production and leave you to kind of mention on the room. I mean, yeah. Uh, as we've guided, you know, the intent is to sell some of the lower value barrels. Um, I mean, Asia is uh, 5,000 barrels a day. Uh, so in terms of percentage of production that we produce, it's a reasonable percent. It's kind of 3, 4, 4 percent. Um, but in terms of revenue, it's minuscule. Um, again, in the, the North Sea, when one takes into account the investment you're having to make to kind of run to stand still, the kind of net revenue position. So we're taking off a material amount of production, but you're not necessarily taking off a material amount of revenue. So, you know, the predominant revenue generators are those West African assets, uh, which we think we can certainly sustain through 14, 15 and towards 16. We've certainly got a plan that keeps them relatively stable through 13, 14, 15. We haven't looked beyond that at the moment. And, uh, and Jubilee certainly, again, will stay stable uh, through that period as well. So we're, we, when we just made the decision to divest of Asia um, and, and the Southern North Sea, that was very much done on the basis that we saw those two key areas being sufficient to fund the exploration campaigns uh, looking forward. I think also, I mean, the time scale that you mentioned, you also should have 10 coming on stream in the middle of 2016. Um, and you know what we're not seeing yet, of course, is you know a full year of jubilee either in, in the numbers that we're seeing at the moment. So that will, um, you know, from 2014, you'll also get a full year of jubilee in, in the sense of a you know 
producing at capacity because it was still sort of somewhat ramping up in 2013. And there will be some offset in terms of PSC um, impacts, but for sure. But uh, overall, I would say, say flat to increasing. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we have a view. I mean, we've yet to form a view of the kind of resources and potential reserves, etc. And once we do that, then we'll, we'll form a view about kind of timing. Um, I think the key things that we have, if we look on a kind of medium-term plan, are definitely, as he says, 10 coming in in 2016. That's the, the core addition and high, you know, high value addition. There's some other less material things around that we're looking at in the same time frame, but we don't really. They're, they're not particularly high value. Um, items, uh, and obviously, as we start to talk and look at East Africa, there's a question in our mind: is you know clearly pipeline volumes, which would be very significant, are probably around 18 and, and beyond. Um, but in in Kenya, we're starting to look and say, could could you have kind of uh, production and revenue from Kenya in the in the shorter term? Uh, and we don't know the answer to that, but that's something we're actively looking at. Hi, it's Mona Blair from Marion Capital. Um, I have two questions, really. One is on Sierra Leone. You said it's under review. What do you think your options there are or in terms of that? And then uh, in Kenya, your acreage position. Uh, is there a point where the government says your acreage position in Kenya is too large and therefore it might be divested away? Thank you. Um, okay. On, on Sierra Leone, um, you know, we... we Put that in the context of the uh, trying to extend the Jubilee play around the West African transform margin, um, and what we proved uh, in that uh, campaign was that the sweet spot in that play is in Ghana, and that the uh, the play um, um, uh, peters out, if you like, as you go uh, towards uh, Sierra Leone. Um, but we got some good seismic there. We got some well controlled well data. We see value in the acreage. We see value in studying the acreage, you know, with uh, with our commitments fulfilled. Uh, so we're in no rush to 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 make hasty decisions about uh, our Sierra Leone um, uh, position. Um, but in the shorter term, we're focusing on the opportunities in Guinea, where we see a step change in that trend, and we do think that the uh, there's a there's an, a real credible opportunity to. Uh, to target a jubilee type prospect in in Guinea, so the the greater West African transform margin play is very much alive, but as I was saying in the, the way we think about campaigns, you know the campaigns have to evolve, they have to adapt to outcomes to well results, and you have to uh, build on the data and build on the successes, but also build on the on the dry holes uh, then in um, the Kenyan acreage uh, position. Um, in our view, and, and we believe that's a, a view sh shared um, by all of our stakeholders, is that as long as we continue to uh, perform um, and deliver uh, the, the results, deliver against uh, what, we're, what we've committed to do and to exceed um, those uh, promises in terms of delivery and in terms of social performance and environmental performance, not only in terms of expiration uh, results, um, then we consider to take take the view that that our our acreage position is is right sized uh, for us and is something that we're you know we're entrusted to uh, um, to, um, to to execute the expiration campaigns as a contractor for the government. Uh, so it's you know it's a it's a position that we respect and uh, it's one that we value and we will um, maintain our aim to maintain our tenureship of that that position. Uh, through uh, delivering on, on, on our commitments and exceeding our promises. Okay, I think we've exhausted all the questions in the room. Can we just see if there are any additional questions on the conference call, please? We will now take our next question from Ritesh Gagar of GMP. Please go ahead. Hi, um, just two questions, uh, please. Um, first one on Kenya in terms of relevance for the significant resource upside. I mean, at this point of time, it's still early days and the focus remains on the South Lokicha Basin. But as you highlighted in the presentation, there are seven other rift basins that you can target. Can you comment on the majority of these basins relative to, uh, to the South Lokicha uh, in terms of geological understanding and possibly any, any drilling news flow? Uh, my second question is on Ghana. 
Uh, can you please provide some details on the progress made um, regarding your discussions with the government on the gas export facilities? Do you think gas flaring, flaring will be an issue in absence of any exports, and could it possibly impact production in 2014? Thank you. Yeah, just on the uh, the distribution of the uh, upside in um, in the Kenyan uh, rift basins, as I say, there's at least uh, eight uh, basins out there, and the first one we drilled, the South Lokachar Basin, has been successful, and that was a campaign we started in 2012. Um, we're drilling in um, the east flank of the South Lokachar Basin this year with the two coals a, a success. And next year, 2014, um, we'll be drilling in the South Kerio Basin, the North Kerio Basin, uh, the North Lokachar Basin, and the, uh, the Turkana, uh, North Turkana Basin systems. Um, we'll also be drilling in Ethiopia in the South Omo and the Tuba here uh, basins. Um, and that's all on top of the drill out of the South Lokachar Basin. So um, until we have those um, wild, wildcat results uh, coming in um, during the course of the next uh, 18, 24 months, um, it, it's difficult and almost impossible for us to, uh, to meaningfully rank the upsides between these uh, different uh, basin areas. Um, as I, as I said, you know, the best way to look at it is from a portfolio point of view, from a scenario point of view. You know, it, we know that uh, that one of these basins works. You know, could could uh, three more work? Entirely possible. You know, could could uh, five more work? Entirely possible. Um, we just have to drill the wells and get the results. We'll keep you posted. Uh, just on the Ghana gas export, I suppose there's, there's kind of two aspects that concern us. One, one is the kind of loss of value and um, uh, in Ghana. Um, I mean, I think there's been a lot of expectations about what the gas could do to the economy and industrial and power and cost of power, etc. So the government is losing out on that due to the, the delays. Um, and we, we have been in dialogue, as you'd expect, continuously around the gas export scheme. It's been, been delayed a number of times. Um, current estimate is uh, early, early next year uh, for the gas export startup. Um, and, and because of that, that additional delay, what we, as I mentioned in the, the slides, we decided to do just to continue to be in the short term decoupled from that gas export um, was basically to add in a further. We will now take our next question from Karen Crowley of Davy. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Thanks for your time. Um, just one question for you, and it's regarding operatorship. Um, I just want to understand how you balance your desire or strategy to be operator of deep water exploration uh, acreage in frontier basins with an exploration budget of circa $1 billion uh, per annum. I suppose I could imagine that, you know, if you're now looking to be operator of more deep water, expensive um, acreage, that, you know, your budget could get chewed up very quickly. Um, and I'm wondering, will your exploration budget actually expand beyond the uh, originally envisaged one billion per annum figure that you, that you previously spoke of? Thanks. Um, I'll start uh, answering that question for you, Karen. First, firstly, on the budget, we're going to uh, stick to delivering 200 million barrels all equivalent per annum from a billion dollars per annum invested. Um, so you're right, then we have to work with that and uh, uh, adapt our strategies to get the right balance between 
um, the various campaigns, uh, some of which are offshore in, in shallow water, some of which are offshore in deep water, and some of which are on, onshore. Um, of the six campaigns, clearly the, the Kenya and Ethiopia one is out front. So, you know, going forward, it's going to mm. get slight loading on uh, resourcing and um, in terms of uh, um, manpower, talent, and, um, and capital. Uh, but we're still active in the uh, offshore arena. Um, there is a slight shift in our strategy from deep water to shallow water, so we're gradually uh, accumulating shallower water acreage positions, uh, still in pursuit of deep water plays, but uh, looking for deep water plays which can be accessed, um, so fossil deep water plays from current shallow water settings. Uh, so that's an adaptation to the paradigm and responding to the uh, challenges of deep water costs and, and complexities. Another uh, jubilee type uh, field, uh, world class deep water field, uh, would, would be a great, great prize. And we're trying to currently get that from either um, uh, Mauritania, um, Guinea, or uh, Suriname, Guyana. So they are the uh, front runners to deliver uh, us another jubilee. Karen, it's Ian here as well. I think also just to mention it from a sort of CFO and, and budgeting and funding perspective. Um, I mean, we are very much a learning organisation, I think, and so our bias is, I think, to operate wherever we can in the exploration phase. Um, at the same time as we set, set out with our uh, strategy, you know, after the uh, annual results, our, our intent is to, you know, spend around a billion dollars per annum on exploration and appraisal. Uh, and I think, therefore, you know, that the, the the outcome of that is that sort of, you know, Angus and team will, will, will manage within those sorts of parameters as well over the course of the next two or three years. Okay, guys. Thanks. That's helpful. We will now take our next question from Jerry Hennigan of Goodbody. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, just going back to uh, French Guyana for a minute. Um, given the uh, apparent divergence of views among the partners there, what, if anything, can you do to change the dynamic? And in the event that the partners keep drilling uh, more along their lines rather than yours, uh, what options might you consider at that point in time? Buying them out. Sorry, I Yeah, no, the... the uh, Apart from that option, there's, um, we've got time to think coming up now. You know, after GMES five, the rig goes off, and um, you know we got uh, five uh, holes in the ground and uh, three three D seismic surveys. So there's there's a there's a period of reflection and data integration, and you know leveraging all that new knowledge that we have, um, and that will also give us time to to uh, you know reassess how the uh, the joint venture has performed as a as a team, and to have some pretty frank discussions in the, in the venture. Record for a Q and A session. Um, perhaps we'll wrap it up now. I'll just hand over to Aidan for a final comment. I think we've had enough questions. <laughs> thank, thank you all for coming.